the history of the projects of European unity from the 18th century to the 1920s uh, are a subset of the history of pacifism. Kant imagined a cosmopolitan federation as a necessary complement to republican constitutions for the achievement of perpetual peace. In 1849, Victor Hugo envisioned a European federation where, quote, war will seem as absurd between Paris and London as it would today between Rouen and Amiens, or between Boston and Philadelphia. The Ligue Internationale de la Paix, League of Peace and Freedom, an organization that included John Stuart Mill, Karl Marx, Alexander Herson, and Mike, Mikhail Bakunin, held its constituted meetings in Geneva to determine, quote, the political and economic conditions of peace among the nations, and in particular to establish the United States of Europe. From its very prehistory, on the contrary, fascism rejected pacifism and consequently the projects of European Union only that came from it. Benito Mussolini had begun his political career as an outspoken supporter of leftist pacifism. But on the question of pacifism, he had broken with socialism, setting him on the path that would lead to the creation of fascism. At, at the beginning of World War I, Mussolini was still asking the Italian socialists to work to defund the Italian army. However, Mussolini quickly abandoned his pacifism, leaving the Socialist Party, and Mussolini founded a new newspaper in Popolo d'Italia, where he promoted Italy's intervention in the war. His first article in his, news, in his new newspaper boldly proclaimed, anti-war propaganda is cowardice propaganda. Mussolini's transition from pacifism to a veritable cult of war never allowed him to see peace or the idea of European unity based on pacifism as a desirable goal. The closer Mussolini moved to the Italian right-wing nationalists, the more he rejected the idea of a permanent international cooperation. As Italian nationalists in the world of Francesco Coppola rejected, quote, the myth of a democratic, humanitarian, pacifist, anti-imperialist organization like the League of Nations and similar universalist formulation, end quote. If Mussolini had remained a simple political agitator and if the project of European unity had continued to be based on pacifism, the two worlds would have continued to diverge and would have never found a common ground. But when the fascists started to govern Italy, they had to bridge the distance between ideology and the reality of Italy's position in Europe. Similarly, as soon as the supporters of European unity try to transform the project into a political reality, they had to cross the distance between pacifist idealism and the European balance of power after World War I. The political reality of the interwar period required Europeanists to take Italy and its dictator into consideration if they wanted a chance to succeed, while Mussolini could not simply ignore a project that would have reorganized Europe because the reorganization of Europe and her colonies was Mussolini's main goal in foreign policy. Thus, briefly, the Europeanist movement tried to find a common ground with fascism. In the interwar period, the movement to unify Europe was moving away from pacifism by its own accord. Richard Kudenov Kalergi, the Austrian count who devoted his life to the creation of the pan Europa movement, was not a radical leftist pacifist, and his pacifism was the moderate pacifism of the Freemasons. Most importantly, contrary to the project that had previously characterized the ideas of the United States of Europe, his 1923 book, Pan-Europa, did not present European unification as an ethical choice, but as a solution to European decadence as a way to restore Europe's last, lost position in the world as a great power. Thus coming closer to the geopolitical approach sponsored by fascism. Kalergi built this argument on the idea of a class of civilization for the control of global resources. In his analysis, the increasing communication speed 
and change the practical dimension of the globe, shrinking distance and making territories that once seemed vast look small. The geopolitical protagonists of the new smaller world were continent-wide political formations along culturally and racial lines. The United States, the Soviet Union, the British Empire, and the future Japanese Empire were organizing their geopolitical interests through federations or empire, commensurate to the new size of the territories that they could control. Western Europe, maintaining its anachronistic division in small nation states, was going to become like Germany in the 17th century, the battlefield of external powers allied with different German princes. On the contrary, and this is kind of Clergy talking, of course, a European federation would have returned Europe to the forefront of world politics, preserving its independence, its economic strength, and its colonies. But he stated emphatically, if the liberation of the European peoples is not compl completed with, it, with its union, the European states will be soon devoured by the world powers that are in full growth. Kalergi retained some of the traditional pacifist arguments in favor of a European federation. In parallel with his new arguments, he held on its traditional council, Kantian ones, which blame more on the anarchy of international relations and on the state of nature in which European nation states move. World peace was still the final goal, but the cosmopolitan universalism of the pacifist project was pushed back in the realm of utopian future. As a biracial free man's non liberal whose goal was to eliminate European nations, Kalergi never had a very good chance to become an ideological reference to the extreme right. Those of you who are familiar with the extreme right know that the Kalergi plan is now the new version of the protocols uh, in the use of the extreme right. Now, nonetheless, his project contained the elements of a European nationalist construction. His appeals to the colonial role of Europeans, who he often identified as the, quote, white race, did not try to hide the, his idea that Europe was a superior race and civilization. Quote, the European civilization, he confidently affirmed, is the civilization of the white race, end quote. The, European great, the Europeans, Great Britain and the US were, quote, the future of the white race, of which Great Britain is the defender in Asia, Africa, and Australia. He saw, quote, the British Empire, Pan-Europa, and Pan-America united by the same political principles and by a cultural and common origins as, quote, a long-term invincible guarantees of the Pacific development of the world civilization. End quote. Of all the continents, Africa was the only one whose civilization he denied, imagining it as a permanent European colony. Despite elements of possible convergence, Mussolini, for ideological and practical reasons, remained unconvinced. Now, I always invite people to take another look at the Schumann's declaration in 1950 and its reference to Africa after knowing about the Pan Europa movement. Italian historiography, in line with the pioneer works by Dinolfo, Carocci, and De Felice, have long recognized that Mussolini's foreign policy was often opportunistic and centered around a revision of Versailles that would have expanded the Italian role in the Adriatic and the colonies. Until the removal of Dino Grandi from the foreign ministry in 1932, the foreign policy of fascist Italy was not significantly different from the foreign policies of liberalism. The formula attributed to Grandi that described Italy as the, quote, determinant weight in the European balance of power actually described the role that the fascist leaders imagined for Italy. In a Europe divided by the conflict between Germany and France, Italy could maximize its political return as long as it was able to support either side. Any project of European unity was necessarily based on a permanent agreement between France and Germany. Thus eliminated the role that the Italian diplomats, including Mussolini, imagined for Italy. Brian's plan to transform the dream of Pan Europa 
into an actual organization of Europe contributed to put Italian foreign policy onto a spin and forced Mussolini to choose ideology over pragmatism. Understanding the Italian fascist regime reaction to Brian's proposal to create the embryo of a European community required the contextualization of his proposal, Brian's proposal, both in the general matrix of Italian foreign policy and the fascist, ideology, the fascist ideological perspective. Dino Grandi achieved some international success for Italy by placing Italy in the camp of those who wanted a consensus solution to European conflict. Italy's crucial objective was to convince France and Great Britain to satisfy the fascist desire to increase the Italian colonial footprint. Since 1925, Italy very explicitly communicated its goal to the French government, accepted to contribute to the peace project as long as Italy was granted access to a colonial empire in Africa. The Italian plan seemed to have been directed to the acquisition of the Portuguese colonies. Gandhi was convinced that the best strategy to achieve the Italian goals was a form of competitive collaboration with France and Great Britain rather than threatening a new European conflict. Even within this framework, Mussolini found pacifism ideologically intolerable. The idea of permanent conflict among nations was Mussolini's perspective on the Italian foreign policy. Grandi could achieve tactical success by talking about disarmament, but fascism, for those who want to pay attention, was not going to be pacifist. Still, Grandi tried to talk to walk a thin line between the tactical support to a European solution and Mussolini's ideological pressure. Trying to justify his foreign policy, the Italian foreign minister told the fascist Grand Consiglio, basically the government of, the, of Italy, quote, perpetual peace is an impossible aspiration. But it is nonetheless true that there are longer and shorter periods of peace. And peace, even more than more, is a difficult daily conquest, which proves no less than more people's values. It is in this climate that Brian's plan of a, quote, sort of European federation reached Italy in May 1930, sponsored by the man who, since the Kellogg Brian Pact of 1928, had tied his name to the promotion of perpetual peace. Since Brian's idea had reached the European newsrooms, a wave of skepticism had emerged. The Manchester Guardian on July 12, 1929, had not means words, quote, if you are not mistaken, Briand is a member of the Pan-European League of which could Kwan Kudenor Kalergi is the founder. If Mr. Briand has in mind anything that resembles the so-called ideals of the Pan-Europeans, it will be impossible to take him seriously, end quote. Despite the objections, Briand's plan was kept alive by Gustav Strassmann, the German foreign minister, who in front of the League of Nations echoed Brian's proposal. Grandi reacted to Brian's project with the usual strategy, push for more than anyone was willing to concede to gain credit and obtain concession. He gave instruction to the Italian press to denounce the narrowness of Brian's proposal, attacking the project not from a nationalist perspective, but from a global perspective. The Corriere della Sera gave voice to Grandi's strategy. Under the heading, Brian's plan gets a cold shoulder in Ginevra, an editorial claimed that Brian's idea was based on false geographical premises. Who could demonstrate, the, demo the newspaper asked, that there is, quote, more affinity between somebody from Sweden and Yugoslavia than between an American and an Englishman, or between an Italian and a South American? End quote. Moreover, it continued, Turkey and the Soviet Union needed to be included if people were serious about a European Union. Brian's project instead, the article affirmed, was only an attempt to promote France's hegemony in Europe. Expanding Brian's plan to include Turkey and the Soviet Union would have obtained in Grandi's strategy the same results as the Italian disarmament proposal he had sponsored in the London conference sabotaging the French strategy without losing the high moral ground. To his ends, Grandi temporarily obtained that Mussolini 
uh, accepted to uh, present Italy as the champion of the League of Nations. However, when Grand Grandi finally prepared the document that was to be the official Italian response to Briand, Mussolini told him not to do so and invited Grandi to take a leave of absence. Grandi understood that Mussolini's rejection of his approach to the Briand project of European unity was the end of his career. Clearly unsatisfied with Grandi's divisibility and eager to fully control the Italian foreign policy, Mussolini was displeased by the decision of the international press to present Grandi's collaborative attitude as smart policy and Mussolini's idea as simple folkloric performances directed to the Italian crowd. Those of you who follow policy, you know how, uh, how often this happens, right? Foreign ministers will say something, prime ministers say something else, and sort of general consensus that the foreign minister is a real guy and the president instead is just talking to his crowd. On June 7, 1930, the New York Times had reported that Italy had changed its tone toward France, engaging with the project of a European Union and regretting Mussolini's bellicose outburst. The day before, the French Le Temps quoted extensively Grandi's speech in front of the Italian Senate and noted that he had invoked mutual understanding, quote, at a time when new projects of European collaboration were on the horizon. Le Temps, like the New York Times, unfavorably compared Mussolini to Grandi. Grandi's approach to Brian's European Union proposal was certainly going to add credit to the idea that Italy believed in a peaceful management of international reject re relations. Mussolini did not want that and decided to say so publicly to an international audience. It shows the British Evening Standard, a conservative newspaper with no sympathy for fascism, to present his position on the Pan-Europa project. The article under the subheading why the United States of Europe scheme is impracticable, impracticable left no room for interpretation. By writing the article himself, Mussolini was implicitly refusing to let his foreign minister represent Italy and was reclaiming for himself the role of the ideological leader of Italian fascism on the theme of a unified Europe. As short and simple as it was, Mussolini's article for the Evening Standard is the most coherent expression of his ideas on European unification. His choice of word was careful and revealing. Quote, complete European calm does not yet exist, the article began, because some European nations like Hungary, Germany, and Italy were not satisfied with the present order of Europe. To the supporters of Pan-Europa, used to the language of perpetual peace, Mussolini, Mussolini's complete calm must have looked as a significant downscale of their desire something suggesting that an alternation between calm and unrest would have continued to characterize history. To the general public, Mussolini's opening salvo suggested that Italy was placing itself squarely on the side of a revision of the European order as it had emerged from World War I, refusing its consolidation until its demands had been met. No calm, not to mention perpetual peace, was in the fascist program, and the European Union, was Mussolini, as, was Mussolini's, uh, as Mussolini affirmed, was premature, to say the least. Mussolini, who clearly cared about the topic, took even the time to engage both Brian's proposal and Calergi's thesis. He recognized that Calergi's premise was accurate. The world was indeed moving toward world politics, and the British Empire had evolved into, quote, pan Britannia. The Monroe Doctrine had created the premise for Pan-America. Russia had extended its goal from Pan-Slavia to Pan-Soviet, which potentially included the entire world. Well, and there were also a Pan-Islam movement and a Pan-India. However, these premises were not enough to make a Pan-Europa possible, because federalists and federations, sorry, not federalists, but federations, did not emerge from political proposal. They were either the result of a long process which united people already, united by common origin, civilization, and blood, or the result of war which united people to a common struggle. In either case, Mussolini suggested, 
force came before federation and a common civilization with common aims and common external threats were the basis for their existence, not peace. I'll be quick. You're cutting Mussolini, so you're all, always in <laughs> <laughs> um, According to Mussolini, Europeans were divided from a racial, economic, and political perspective, contrary to what the pan-European movement claimed. Kalergi had written in, the Pan in Pan Europa that, quote, the European civilization is the civilization of the white race, but Mussolini saw Europeans as racially divided and wrote that the European, quote, racial complexions are too markedly different and would produce a European mongrel rather than a thoroughbred, end quote. Similarly, their national interests were too diverging and their aspiration too conflictual to imagine a common European civilization as the basis for a European unity. By the same token, Mussolini did not believe Calergi claimed that Europe was facing external threats from global extra-European superpowers. Quote, Europe is not a rust, yes, by pressure from without. On the contrary, though, the attempt to create a European Union, while destined to fail, because Europeans were not a single people, could provoke a reaction. And a federation might create such pressure, quote, and Pan-Europa might easily be met by Pan-America and Pan-Britannia, unifying the adversaries of Europe much more than Europeans themselves. Finally, of course, after rejecting Pan-Europa's philosophical premises, perpetual peace, its historical one, the unity of European civilization, and its political ones, the creation of world superpowers to face other world superpowers, Mussolini even attacked its geographical premises. Great Britain and Russia, he wrote, were as much part of Europe as they were extra-European empires. Quote, Pan-Europa would be faced with the embarrassing choice of deciding whether she wants to leave half of Europe out, with the exclusion of Great Britain, the strongest European power, or take in, quote, all parts of the world with Great Britain and half of Asia with Russia. If the pacification of Europe was the goal, Mussolini concluded, it was necessary to resolve this conflict. Mussolini's intervention, and this is the last paragraph, I promise, despite its clarity, did not produce immediate consequence for Italy's foreign policies. The international press had solidly embraced the narrative that Mussolini's words were always propaganda or tactics without strategic coherence. Consequently, Mussolini's ideological piece on Briand's European Union plan could be discarded by contemporaries as propaganda. However, the cycle war empire temporary calm rather than federation perpetual peace were indeed Mussolini's ideological lenses for the understanding of foreign policies and the construction of an Italian empire, a real objective of his foreign policy. Among Italian fascists, other approaches could be tolerated, and they were, there were multiple approaches within Italian fascism to the question of European unity. But Mussolini's ideological vision would relegate any major deviation from this perspective to the ideological curiosities at the fringes of fascist orthodoxy. 